Somebody always sets the temperature. Someone always sets the foundation to what the environment's gonna be like for a conversation. Mm -hmm. Somebody always does it, whether intentionally or unintentionally. And for people in sales or people who run companies or people in their houses, right? Somebody always sets the temperature. Mm -hmm. And I just chose that that was gonna be me. Now, I'm not a perfect thermostat, right? Sure. We always have bad days and you're always learning. But I realized I wanted to set the temperature because what I realized is most people go through life reading the room. Hmm. They are reactionary, yeah. they are responsive, and they, they walk into a space and go, is this uncomfortable? Yes, everybody's uncomfortable. Hmm. Well, not everybody's uncomfortable. Somebody set the temperature of the room that this was gonna be uncomfortable. Yeah. Or this is exciting. Right, someone set a temperature, right? My, my howl's gonna be really bad. It's all right. No one's howl's very good. I've just had 75 episodes of practice. <laughs> <laughs> What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Sales Wolves podcast. I'm your host, Tyler Harris. We have today... Jonathan Parker, glad to be here. And we are the Sales Wolves. Uh, <laughs> How was that? It's not too bad. Not too bad? It's my first howl. We'll work on it. <laughs> I need 75 episodes of practice. <laughs> it wasn't too bad. It wasn't too bad? Special guest today, Mr. Jonathan Parker. Um, those of you that check out my other podcast, the Breadwinner Podcast, you've probably heard him on there. Uh, but man, I'm excited to have him in. He was in the office anyways, just yes, catching up because we up. hadn't sat down in a while. And I was like, hey, might as well just flip this camera on and, <laughs> and, record, yeah. and record a podcast and continue the conversation. Um, speaking of conversations, um, that is Jonathan's, I was going to say specialty, but it's really more your, just like your passion and yeah. purpose is this, the art of conversation. Uh, and I've told this story before. I told it yesterday too, by the way. <laughs> the first time we ever met was at Starbucks and we sat and talked and probably for 45 minutes, an hour. I got in my car and I was like, I need to never talk ever again to anyone because I'm the worst person at conversation ever in comparison. And it was incredible to have, to have someone in conversation be so good that you would be able to say that. Thank you. It sounds weird to say, be so good. Be so, be good. so good at conversation. conversation. But it was. It like how it, bad most people are. It, it is, it is. But it was, it was that feeling of like feeling like you're the only person that lives on the planet in that hour. Or feel like the person actually is listening to what you're saying or the questions and follow-up questions that they're actually in, interested in digging deeper into what you're talking about and those types of things, which is, which is awesome. But as I've gotten to know Jonathan more, there's so many more layers to this art of conversation. Right. And now it's been awesome to see him on stages of TEDx and speaking to corporations and traveling around the country, speaking about this topic that for you was such a big passion. Huge passion. For your entire life. Right. Um, so it's cool to me to anytime I am able to see someone that's doing what they're supposed to be doing. Well, and thank it's you. obviously something that you're supposed to be doing. So we're gonna talk about uh, a little bit about that, uh, the art of conversation, and some specific topics that, that Jonathan's really been hitting on lately. Um, but maybe give them, because a lot of these people have not um, heard the Breadwinner podcast, give them maybe the three minute uh, version of kind of where the art of conversation came right. from being kind of your growing up yeah, and, and why sure. speech was so important to you. Yeah, well thanks for having me on. Yeah, It's always fun to talk. So it's interesting, so three minutes, 180 seconds, mm -hmm. right? Did I do that math right? 180 it. seconds. It's one of those interesting things when I think back on why conversation is so important, it's because I did not realize how important it was to my mom. So I just came off, okay. I just came off spending some time with her. Yeah. So I was really sick when I was a child, had seizures, didn't really talk well uh, or coherently, had my own language up until about four and a half. Okay. And my mom had to work so hard to get me to speak. And I realized after spending some more time with her this past week, it's because she valued conversation. Mm. So she wanted her son to be able to have a conversation and talk because she valued it, yeah. which just shows you that what you value, you encourage in others, but also instill in your kids, right? Yeah, so I was really sick growing up, wasn't able to talk. 
and my mom and some other teachers had to work really long and hard to get me to be able to speak well. Mm -hmm. And I got to that place and I fell in love with speaking, whether that was, you know, preaching uh, at my church or speaking in a play or giving, a, I love speech class. Some people were terrified of speech yeah. class. I love speech class. <laughs> and I just was talking and I was talking and I took it for granted, right? People would say, I love to hear you talk. I love when you get up to speak or you ask good questions. And I took it all for granted. And when I took it for granted, I actually took my mother's work for granted. Mm. Right, so like when I took some for granted, I took for granted what someone instilled in me. True. And I took them personally for granted. So up, you know, three and a half years ago, I'm in a delicate, rough spot, unsure what I'm supposed to do, what I'm supposed to be doing, I'm angry, I'm bitter, all, you know, my fault, right? Uh, taking responsibility for that. Not at the time, at the time it was sure. everybody else's fault. Oh, yeah. But I still had all these, I still had regular opportunities to speak. And you know, I'm sitting at a, a dessert table with another couple, my wife Jessica and I and this other couple, and I'm just whining and complaining 45 minutes, just going on and on and how I'm perfect and awesome and all these other people have missed the boat on the glory that is Jonathan Parker. Yes. And he cuts me off middle of a sentence and he just looks at me and goes, how many years are you gonna waste waiting for permission to do what you already know you should be doing? Mm -hmm. And he just, you know, like sledgehammer to the chest. Yeah. And my wife is the one that says, can you say that again? <laughs> and I think she wanted that to really settle into my mind. Yeah. How many years are you going to waste waiting for permission to do what you already know you should be doing? So I left that conference saying, I'm going to do two things. And one of those things I was going to do was study everything I could about a conversation. Mm -hmm. And for two, two and a half years, I studied by myself, personal journey, what makes a conversation a good conversation? Why do people like to hear me talk? Yeah. What is the power of questions? Why am I a bad listener? Like philosophically, and then it was practically, what can I do to be better at this and better at this? And I did for me. You know, we were talking earlier, right? Yeah. Doing things for me. Yeah. And then someone's like, hey, will you teach it? No, right? <laughs> like, this is personal, sure. this is for me. And then I did it in 2016, and since that time, I've continued to learn and grow but this idea of the art of the conversation, that we create art and that it is an art, has just flowed. And it's been fun to watch people become remarkable vocal artists yeah. through the conversation. So if anyone says, and again, I don't know everybody's past, I don't know your past, sure. but I think, I think you just posted it or maybe the company just did, the idea of you're not your past, mm -hmm. right? So just keep moving forward. Yep. So you know the guy, the young man who couldn't talk, who was really sick, mm -hmm. You know, who's, who had all these things against him or just obstacles to overcome, yep. you can do it. And sometimes you gotta do it for you, but that's where our the conversation came from. So, that guy Dan Clark that I was just telling you yeah. about, incredible speaker, Speaker's Hall of Fame. His mentor was Zig Ziglar. He kind of like, oh. got a like nice, well, I mean, nice little. Talking about someone there. instilling in you. Yeah. Um, he said something very interesting in that speech, and when you just spoke it, it reminded me of it. He said, I'm the best version of myself when I'm with you. Mm. And in the last part, I'm trying to remember, it was like, I'm the best version of myself when I'm with you and I want to see you again. Or like, and I want, and I want to be with you again. Or something. Right. It had something okay. to do with that. But it was this phrase that he would tell people hmm. uh, and that he would want people to feel right. that they are the best version of themselves when they're with me and that we should get together again soon, basically. Nice. I thought that was pretty awesome that, is uh, that he said that. Uh, but let's dig in a little bit on this concept of setting the temperature. Okay. And normally the people that are watching the Sales Wolves podcast are used to seeing me just like sweating and my guests sweating. <laughs> yeah, it's true. So the temperature has been finally set in the studio. It's cool. It actually is it's cool. It's very like comfortable. It's, man, I might need a little jump. I was a little like prepped to just sweat <laughs> yeah, I profusely. Know. It's like part of the process of bring people in. It's like a sauna. And being bald, you kind of mm -hmm. get that nice, just mm -hmm. wet kind of. That nice preacher glow. Right. And if you touch it, it's like the dam breaks and it just pours down. <laughs> the beads start getting bigger. Yeah, and bigger yeah. And, and once, once it's broken, <laughs> it just That's flows. Funny. So talk about, first I want to know kind of where it came from. Where did this yeah. concept of setting the temperature, being the thermostat, where did that come from? And then let's just kind of dig into it. So that idea, it's not original with me. So I don't remember the first time I heard them compared. Mm -hmm. But when I, the, as memory serves me, the first time I heard them compared, they weren't together. Okay. It was this idea of, 
you need to, and it's in books and it's podcasts, it's, it's things I've heard. And again, it's one of those things where if you're always learning, yeah. sometimes it's hard to remember. I had a, I would consider him a friend, but he was uh, somebody I got to meet very briefly at a speaking opportunity. And he said, if you steal one thing, if you steal one thing from a person, that's called plagiarism. But if you steal a bunch of things from people, it's called research. <laughs> so this is my research. And there's this idea of a thermostat that the point of a thermostat is to set the temperature. You, you, that's why you have one. And then at another point, it was this idea of a thermometer reads the temperature, yeah. right? So if you put it in your mouth, that's how you know if you have a fever or not. And I remember it was a, going through the art of the conversation, I realized, and, and like learning for myself, that somebody always sets the temperature. Someone always sets the foundation to what the environment's gonna be like for a conversation. Mm -hmm. Somebody always does it, whether intentionally or unintentionally. And for people in sales or people who run companies or people in their houses, right, somebody always sets the temperature. Mm -hmm. And I just chose that that was gonna be me. Now, I'm not a perfect thermostat, right? Sure. We always have bad days and you're always learning. But I realized I wanted to set the temperature because what I realized is most people go through life reading the room. Hmm. They are reactionary, yeah. they are responsive, and they, they walk into a space and go, is this uncomfortable? Yes, everybody's uncomfortable. Hmm. Well, not everybody's uncomfortable. Somebody set the temperature of the room that this was gonna be uncomfortable. Yeah. Or this is exciting. Right, someone set a temperature, right? You go into a basketball game, you don't get hyped up because of basketball. You get hyped up because of the MC or because of the music, right? Yeah. Somebody sets the temperature. Mm -hmm. That's why you can go to a football game at Clemson and a football game at Riverside High and it feel completely different, yeah. even though the same sporting event's happening. Yep. Why? Because someone sets the temperature. So this idea of being a thermostat in conversation is that you've decided you're gonna set the temperature to have a remarkable, purposeful, intentional conversation with someone. Mm -hmm. And the reason this differentiates from other people is because the majority of people talking are just waiting to read what you're doing. Mm -hmm. So in most conversations, if, if neither one of us wanted to set the temperature, you'd be reading me, I'd be reading you, you'd be reading me, I'd be reading you, and I'd be worried about what I was gonna say, and you'd be worried about what you were gonna say. What's that client gonna say? What's this yeah. person gonna say? Because we're just responsive. Yeah. And that's why we get in arguments. Mm. Because we're all of a sudden shocked when someone says something, and now I've gotta to react to it. Mm. So in essence, my thermometer goes up. Yeah. So if you say something that may not be offensive, but it offended me, my thermometer, like, yeah. Spikes and I get all. I mean, we can really beat this analogy. That sure. we get, I get hot, right? Yeah. yeah. And then you've been reading me, and you're like, "How dare you say I'm offensive?" And then you spike, mm -hmm. and there's no th thermostat setting the temperature. So where it came from was research, yeah. right? Just years of listening, years of watching things, and I was, I was a thermometer, and I, I was a thermometer. I read it, and then I was a bad thermostat. Because I liked, I, well, rephrase, I thought I liked debate. <laughs> I thought I liked argument. Mm -hmm. So I would set the temperature really hot. And what I realized is that doesn't produce remarkable vocal art. Vocal art is what I call conversations, yeah. right? So what you have to understand is you have to set the temperature. You have to be the thermostat. So you consciously decide, no matter where you're going, home, office, work, client meeting, dinner, I'm gonna set the temperature, this is gonna be fun, this is gonna be intentional, this is gonna be purposeful. The words that come out of my mouth are the words I want to say. Mm. And I wanna free everybody to read that, to read that, and then to be able to respond accordingly. Mm. So if you're watching this and you're a leader or you're in sales yeah. or you run a company and you want your people to get better, you get better. Mm. And you set the temperature because they're probably just responding to you. They're reading you and then responding. So you gave that example of two people that were being thermometers right. and just reading each other. What does that scenario look like when two people are trying to set the temperature or be the thermostat? So I think it looks a little bit like how when we walked into the room. Yeah. And I don't know if you consciously went through, oh, yeah, Jonathan's coming in. This is the last thing we talked about, right? Because sure. it's probably becoming part of your DNA now, yeah. just calm, cool, collected, fun, intentional, purposeful. Sure. Um, it goes back to something you posted. Uh, I, am I the only one that hates small talk? Yeah. <laughs> small talk generally is the result of thermometers. Got it. Okay. 
now. This is just like feelers just to catch yeah, the vibe. Just, just to, to catch the vibe. See where we're at. Right. <laughs> we okay on this bus together? No. <laughs> what about the airplane? <laughs> thermostats, when two thermostats come together, generally they're, the temperature is almost the same. Hmm. Right? So, I, I mean, I don't want to say it's a cool 70, but yeah, yeah. for the most part, we're thinking intentionally, we're thinking purposely. So when I walk into the room of thermostats, we got right into, hey, where are we coming from? Oh, this. Why there? And like you just dig, yeah. you dig deep. So it's almost like it might be where I may be coming in hot, you may be coming in cold, but by doing the by doing so, we kind of meet in the middle. We meet in the middle, right. Yeah. And and this is the other piece about being a thermostat. Sometimes you are hot and you know it. Mm -hmm. Like it's a frustrating day, it's a yeah. frustrating morning. That didn't go well. And you've set the temperature because you just you just know. Mm -hmm. But then you get somebody who also is interested, and they come in, they're like, hey, man, what's going on? Yeah. You all right? Let's talk this out. Mm. I don't have time for pleasantries when I can tell the environment, the room, mm. isn't right. And this is something that I say to people, mostly like managers or leaders of groups and teams, and, I, and it works for sales too. If you go into the room and it doesn't feel right, mm. like your team's off, yeah. or there's one person who set the temperature, and you're coming in, you're like, Whoa, wait, hold on. Yeah. You just have to, you have to name it. Yeah. Like, Call it out. there's something not right here. Okay, so you name it, then own it. What's going on? Mm -hmm. And then you can actually do something about it. Yeah. So, so you can set, but when someone comes it's in. a huge leadership trait there yeah. to be able to do that. Well, talk through that. How is it a leadership well, I mean, trait? To me, I can just envision a group of people and, you, and, and the leader walks in and, and there's just this odd just tone of the room and you can tell that something's wrong right. to be able to just say all right let's stop let's figure out what's what's going on right something's i'm feeling something's not right here which will ultimately lead to an uncomfortable conversation more than likely right well so and so said this and you know well, if this happened you know, and this and this and this and this and this okay let's figure all that out and then let's get back to where we're at because we're not getting anywhere right now. We're not getting anywhere with this under with this underlying issue going right. on. Uh, but it takes it takes a strong leader to be able to embrace that discomfort, no doubt, and and deal with it up front. Uh, so let me ask you this: what What would you say to someone who's watching? Yeah. So you're a leader. You go in, and you know you have a 30 minute meeting, and this has to get done, but the room doesn't feel right. Yeah. And you come in, and you're like, hey, we got to figure this out, but that takes 20 minutes. Yeah. How How would you respond to well, I, I didn't get done what I needed to get done. I would say you did get done what needed to get done. Right. Right? Yeah. Because, there's, because the reality is that it's not just that 30 minute meeting. Right. <laughs> that, that, that's something that's probably gonna be going on or would go on for months right. if not addressed. Um, and I think that to me, just this idea of being a leader, that that's it. Like someone that's able to bring up the awkward, the uncomfortable yeah. and handle those situations so that they don't turn into bigger issues right. down the road. Um, yeah, that's that's huge. And, and there's this piece too in conversation, and I think you, I mean, I think you're exactly right. When a leader, again, there's leadership traits you're born with, right? Mm -hmm. Some you learn, yeah. but some of it's also a choice. Sure. <laughs> like if you've never thought of yourself as a leader and you're watching this, congratulations. I'll tell you, your leader mm -hmm. set the temperature, right? Because yeah. if you set the temperature, you're a leader because yeah. people are going to follow. Mm -hmm. And this idea of it is when you say, hey, I want to be the leader and set the temperature, you don't have to be the guy running the meeting. You know, so when I, I work yeah. with, and I don't even like this term, but for the sake of conversation, like this idea of middle management, you know, the people in the middle, mm -hmm. generally the question I get asked after I'm done doing training on this is like, well, how do I do if I'm not in charge? Who says you're not? Yeah. Somebody's going to set the temperature in the room, and if you're not the boss, the leader, choose to be. Yeah. And you can just look at whoever's running the meeting and just going, hey, hey, Tyler, th this might be out of place, but I don't know about anybody else, but does anyone else feel like something's up here? Like, mm -hmm. this doesn't feel good, and I know we need to have a productive conversation, but am I the only one, if I'm the only one feeling this, cool, but I feel like there's something <laughs> yeah. off. Yeah, that's huge. And you just do that, the boss is gonna be like, oh, cool. Mm -hmm. Is something going on? A good boss, I should yeah. say. Especially so, one that's not that's not aware. That's not aware. Yeah. And someone who wants good culture. Mm -hmm. So, and, but see, that can't be done unless your people know how to have a conversation. Yeah. Until you realize that conversations are outside of breathing, 
it's really the most unnatural and unthoughtful, but very thoughtful and uh, intentional thing that you do, right? Yeah. Yeah. Like you don't think about breathing, yeah. but you breathe. But you can take it. You can take a breath and ten, intentionally. Intentionally take it. Conversations the same way. Yeah. Like you do have conversations all the time. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're always communicating, but you're always having conversation, yeah. and it's almost natural, meaning it just happens. But it's also intentional. It's unnatural too, because we become so used to not having. Them. Do you see setting the temperature as as kind of the ultimate like alpha male trait? Is that That's is interesting? How would you define alpha male? I would define it as the person that sets the temperature. Okay. I mean, literally. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's, right. That to me is the person that comes into the room and in, and instantly sets the temperature, and you know that okay, now right. you can you can sense it immediately. Yeah, that's an interesting question. I, I think one of the ways I think about just kind of re yeah. responding to this is setting the temperature is something you choose to do because you know it's best for you, but it's an indication of you thinking about other people. Mm. Right? You're making a choice to allow other people to succeed. Interesting. You're saying, I value this team. I value this person who I want to make a sales to. This, this uh, organization, my culture, my family. Like I'm setting the temperature, one, because it's good for me, but I'm also setting because I think of you. So I, maybe the alpha male, just that, the alpha dog in the yeah. room, maybe the way it's, thinking about it that way is it's a, it's a characteristic of someone who really thinks well about themselves, but also thinks about what's best for all people, mm. like for the people in the room. Yeah. Yes, it is good for me. But you know what's not good for me? If I'm having a great day Everybody else. and everyone else is having a terrible day and I've got to go in there and go, all right, hey, y'all, I really wanted to have this amazing conversation or, hey, we really needed to do this, but what's best for you is that I set the temperature here and we have a candid conversation. Mm -hmm. That's the other thing. I've started to use the word candid yeah. rather than challenging or hard or crucial or critical because all of those sound really intense yeah. and and like oh man this is gonna be really awful <laughs> can we just be candid like yeah. let's just be candid for five minutes and and like and it's not to be hurtful mm -hmm. but we're just gonna be can it'll just be candid for yeah. five minutes my uh my grandparents they just celebrated I can't remember how many years of marriage they've been they're 89 and 90 89 and 90 years old good for them and they've been boyfriend and girlfriend since the first grade. That's beautiful. Isn't that crazy? That's incredible. And one time I heard my grandmother say that your grandfather and I had some intense fellowship. There you go. The other night. And that's, that's their definition of an argument. That's an argument. Intense, intense fellowship. Intense fellowship. That's what they said. One, one last thing I wanted to talk to you about. Yeah. Um, and this is kind of curveball. But you've read The Four Agreements? I haven't read it, okay. but I know enough about it. So the first one, being impeccable with your word. Yep. Let's talk real quickly about this idea of the art of conversation with yourself. Oh, yeah. Because that's a whole nother not, right. not quick conversation. Exactly. But the idea of being impeccable with your word, to me, is, has been so huge in my transformation over the last few years and auditing the things that I would say to myself. Yeah. Uh, say to myself. Um, realizing the power of the words that you have over yourself. Right. Um, using words like never and always <laughs> right. and things like that. Yep. And to me, it was just, I looked at it from the beginning as just the law of attraction. Mm -hmm. But there's so much more to that internal dialogue than people yeah. realize. Right. And people don't realize that they're sabotaging their day, sabotaging their career, sabotaging right. their relationships, not because of the conversation that they're having with those people, but the internal dialogue that they're having with themselves before they even get to the point to have a conversation exactly. with somebody else. Right. So is there maybe a couple little things that you've picked up along the way as you've really dug in the conversation as a whole on right. um, what it means with the conversation that you have with yourself? Yeah, so when I, when I do training on Art of the Conversation, everybody's interested in what I call the public gallery, right? This is yeah. a public gallery. Yeah. We're having a conversation, two people, you know, it's, it's going to be remembered by us, and there's cameras to sure. know, monument this for all time. <laughs> so that's the public gallery. What people don't understand is you cannot do publicly what you don't do privately. Yeah. And what I, so internal dialogue, I call your private gallery. Okay. I call it the private gallery. Yeah. This is the first things you say to yourself in the morning. 
This is what you say to yourself when you step out of the shower. Yeah. This is what you say to yourself when you're in the gym or at the table or in your own thoughts driving in the car, your private gallery. And now you can fake it, right? <coughs> you can fake it for sometimes publicly. Sure. And you can just dial it in and you're like, you know, check those boxes. Mm -hmm. It's not sustainable. But it's not sustainable. So if, you're, if your private gallery starts with things like, I am not, I cannot, I never will, I always do, mm. I'm a failure, I'm a loser, look, I'm out of shape. I mean, if, yeah. you, if that's your private gallery, no one else sees it, yeah. right? It's behind closed doors, but you walk those halls yeah. every day. Mm -hmm. At some point, your private gallery will catch up with you publicly, yeah. and you'll be sitting across from trying to make a sales mm. or trying to run a team and you're like, you know what, I am a failure. I am yeah. a loser. I know I can't do this. What am I doing? You know, I, this is ridiculous. It's almost like a good analogy would be, as from the thermostat, is you're walking into a room on 90 and you're trying to instantly take that room to 70. Well, correct. And you're realizing that it's gonna take a couple hours yeah. for that 20 degree change right. to happen because of what you brought into the room exactly. yourself. And that's, I mean, you probably, I mean, you probably have seen this, maybe even yourself, but all of us know these people. They come into the office hot. Yeah. <laughs> it's 8 a.m. and they're angry. And you're like, what has happened between when you got up to yeah, now that you're sure. so angry? And, you know, that idea of they need, especially leaders, you can't just dial that back down. Mm -hmm. Even if you, like, all right, let's just do this, I'll just bury it. You can't do that. Yeah. So this idea of a private gallery, this idea of what you say to yourself, needs to be like some of the first things in the morning that you begin to change. Yeah. So yes, I mean, I woke up this morning, I was away with my family. We were at you know the beach, my kids were loving it. Yeah. Uh, we had my, my sister and brother-in-law and their kids were there, my parents were there, right? So priorities were, were still important, but things shift when you yeah, got that many people sure. in the beach house. My wife and I, last night, we were like, all right, we gotta go to bed. We were in bed by 10.30. Yeah. Why? Because the alarm's going off and I gotta get up. Yeah. And the workout today was painful, mm -hmm. right? And not knowing that I could just eat whatever I wanted, right? Because yeah. you don't know, no, I gotta be, I gotta have energy. So, but one of the first things I did when I woke up, is I got you know, into the restroom and I'm getting ready, and, I'm, and I just said, I can do this. Yeah. I can do this. Mm -hmm. I can do this. It's not, I'm exhausted, it's not, I'm so tired. Or, yeah. Oh, it's gonna be, no, it's like, I can do this, mm -hmm. I can do this. And that internal dialogue, that personal temperature, yeah. that private gallery, is, is generally what people don't want to address. Hmm. I, I mean, I, I mean it and I jokingly say it, nobody hires me to do training on, hey, let's talk about private galleries. Mm -hmm. Like, as a group, as a vulnerable, transparent, candid group, let's talk about what you tell yourself every day. And let's let what you do personally change what you do corporately. Huge. It's massive. Because that's the only way you can create change is first changing yourself. Right. It's huge. So when I do corporate training, I always tie in personal stuff. Oh, yeah. But the power of saying, hey, let's go personal and then corporate mm -hmm. is because that's what, I mean, you've shared it on social yeah. media. I mean, that was me. Let's change personal and then watch it, watch it grow. Mm -hmm. Well, that's awesome. Guys, go check out the Breadwinner podcast with Mr. Jonathan Parker on it, <clears throat> because we go a lot deeper into the art of conversation sure. there. Um, we'll have to have you on this one again, Be awesome. um, because there's some other stuff I want to talk about as far as how to create space. Yeah, That's a big a key. thing I've been thinking about a lot lately, uh, especially for men, how yep. to create space. Um, so we'll do that sometime soon. But go, guys, I hope you enjoyed uh, this podcast, which is episode 75. Holy 75. cow. You guys are old. We are getting up there. We are <laughs> now officially old. <laughs> I am Tyler Harris, Jonathan Parker, and we are the Sales Wolves. Oh.